show today. I'm standing in for Brandon Cowell, who is usually here. Uh, so this is my first day joining, but I'm happy to be here. Well, thank God Brandon's not here. <laughs> God. Yeah, he's not coming back. You won't hear from him again, ever. He's gone. <laughs> Lost his job. Yeah, finished. We sent him to Nevada. And he's <laughs> Bye, Brandon. Yeah, see Replaced. you later. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, like I said, my name's Eden. Uh, I'm an actor by trade. That's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm trained in. I did a BFA undergrad at the University of Windsor. Uh, I kind of specialize in the more classical side of theater, uh, Shakespeare, Greek. You know, check off the whole the whole shebang. Um, that's what I do. Right. Um, I've kind of furthered my training since I moved to Toronto. I've been here for about just shy of a year and a half. Yeah. I've been doing everything from auditing classes, obviously the industry here in Toronto is insane, so it's been a lot more uh, film-based work right. for me uh, this past year and a half. But um, I've been really involved in the TIFF circuit, I've done a lot of PR, I've been everything from a personal assistant to coffee girl number five, who, yeah. you know, they hand, hand odd jobs off to. So I'm just trying to entrench myself in every form of uh, the entertainment industry that I can. So yeah, just getting all the experience you can. Exactly, and I found this. So yeah. absolutely, this has been uh, it's been awesome. I'm glad to be here. And do you own any investments right now? I don't know, but a lot of my family. Uh, I'm a starving artist. You know, we'll get there. We'll get there one day. Um, but a lot of my family does, particularly uh, in the cannabis sector. Okay. Um, absolutely, I've got. Uh, People with GW Pharmaceuticals, uh, they've got stocks in that, they've got stocks in, yeah, uh, yeah and um, Canopy as well. Um, I'm trying to think of what some of the other stocks my family has, but especially on my mom's side, all of them just... They're into the cannabis. They're into it, yeah. Well, Yeah. on that note. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> those, segue. Uh, <clears throat> those stocks today, Eden, are not doing very well. In fact, there's Ooh. blood in the streets, as we would say. Oh, gosh, okay, yeah. do explain. Do you explain well? So Canopy, for example, is down, I think, 13% right now, which wow. is a significant uh, hit. And they released their financials today. Uh, obviously, the market didn't like them. As yeah. I'm I, looking at live trading, by the way. Okay, so when cool. I'm looking at my computer, so, you know, All right, I'm seeing what's actually Thanks. happening live. So Canopy is down about 13%. Jeez. Uh, Aurora Cannabis, which is one of the other big ones, yeah. uh, is down... Eight percent. So the big hit today was on was on Canopy, and it was because of their their financials. And you know, I think I think a lot of people were expecting this, but um, I guess some people weren't. So so anyway. what what do you, what do you think caused like what is causing that? Well, their valuation is extremely high. I don't know exactly what I can look at what it is. Um, so let's have a little peek at what their market cap would be. So what their uh, <clears throat> Basically, what the company is being valued right now. Let's let's have a look. Okay. Check it out on my phone. Yeah, I'll break it to my family. You know, nicely. Right, <laughs> right now, what Let I'm them seeing, gently. I'm seeing that Canopy is worth around 15 billion. I mean, that still sounds like a huge number to me. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, they 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 don't make a lot of money either. So a yeah. lot of their market cap, a lot of their valuation is based on projections and what they're going to do, and so it's a you know, they, these cannabis stocks have gone on this blue sky sort of uh, speculative run. And, you know, <clears throat> the reality is going to set in with these companies, um, you know, when financials come out. Like, how much money are you making? So, I mean, there's still going to be a significant amount of speculation, forward-looking um, stuff here, where projections where these companies are expected to, you know, grow and whatever. Yeah. But right now, they're taking a pretty big hit. And the global markets right now are not looking... That good. So, do you um, specifically pertaining to Canada? Do you has legalization has that been a correlation between the the stocks going crazy or? Well, so so the way it works, it's more like um, <clears throat> the speculators in cannabis have really made a significant amount of money if you were to have sold uh, for the last two to three years, right? Yeah. So what happens is you get more of a sell on news, right? So so when cannabis became legal here on the recreational side, we actually saw, uh, you know, weeks leading after, uh, a sell on news. Yeah. So the stocks didn't go up really after that, right? They came down. Yeah. Um, so, but they went on, you know, look at Canopy. Like, I first got into Canopy when it was around, uh, just under three bucks was my first buy. And yeah. that thing went in, into the $70 range. Wow. Yeah. And then by the time it was legal, it was, it was coming down. So, 
Um, yeah, that's what's going on right now in the cannabis space. Um, but what I am seeing is there's a lot of fear. Yeah. Uh, typically, and I'm not giving advice to anyone, but t typically that's usually, when there's an extreme amount of fear is usually when you should be buying. But right now it's different because I think the markets are taking a very uh, cautious approach. Yeah. Um, because the global markets right now, it's really weird. Like you've got the S&P, which is uh, in the States, uh, these big companies that aren't doing that well, their guidance is, um, aren't as strong as many, uh, you know, as an investors and funds want to see. So because you have this sort of weakness in the, in the global markets, you're, it's now sort of, it's, translating. it's a trickling over effect. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening. Anyway, so you don't hold those stocks personally. So, I mean, you're not really. I mean, I, it's, it's no skin off my nose right now, right, right now. now. But yeah. definitely it's, uh, well, it's good to know because, you know, like coming on the show, like I really am coming on with about as much knowledge as the average investor would be who's right. looking to get into stocks. Because it's something, it's something that I'm definitely interested in, particularly now with cannabis being legalized in Canada and um, all the different companies that are out there now. It wasn't until I'd say the past two years that I actually started hearing these names like Canopy, Aurora, um, you know, like all these Tweed, like all these mm -hmm. companies that are out there. So I'm definitely interested, but it's good to get all this information now and to see the, the patterns. Yeah. So like legalization doesn't necessarily mean good yeah. things. Yeah, and that's cool. And I like the fact that you, you know, you're, uh, you don't have all that experience and we're going to do some interviews here and it's good to see the kind of questions that you would ask. Yeah. And I think it's relatable to a lot of people in our audience that are, are newer too. So that's yeah. good. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a lot of good questions for our, uh, our interviewers, our interviewees yes. today. Yeah. Yes, we've done some prep work. Yes, we've done our research, people. We really have. <laughs> All right, awesome. So um, we're going to throw it over to a pre-recorded segment that we did um, earlier with our client Evenco, and it's with Brandon and Melinda. So we're going to send it over to them. And we're here today with Melinda Rombout, CEO of Evenco. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And it's been a little while now. It's six or seven weeks or so since yeah. you last came on. Uh, for those who are looking for an overview of your company, you can always go to FTMIG.com. We had that video on there where we discussed uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do. But there's been a really big milestone that has come in between our last visit. Legalization. Yeah. How's it been so far? Ah, it's been, uh, I used to say we go 100 miles an hour and I was more like 200. Yeah. So uh, it's been interesting. Um, so, you know, we continue to harvest, you know, full production. Um, so we did not ship right away. So we had, uh, we found out early October that there was uh, something on our license that we had to clear up first. So Health Canada has been very good about working with us to try to get that cleared up. So we're hoping mm -hmm. within the next couple of weeks that we'll be able to ship out. Oh, that's good. And that's actually one of my questions from today. We had reached out to the Evenco uh, investors group and, and some of our community as well just to ask questions. What are you curious about about your company? And one of them was the sales license. I believe it was initially, uh, it was supposed to go LP to LP instead of province to province. And there's, uh, you know, Health Canada is one of those things where they're, they're very busy. Yes. We, we could probably say that. They're very yeah. busy. But uh, so that is what we're waiting for right now. That's what's holding up the initial uh, shipment of, of product is this amended license? Right. So we were licensed under um, the ACMPR under 22.2. Mm -hmm. And then we, so we had asked in July, it's like, okay, when our license is migrated, are we good to go with the provinces? is not actually didn't hear back until the beginning of October because it was really unsure. They, even yeah. the regulators themselves, it was it's very unknown, you know, how it was all going to migrate. So, yeah. but they've been very good about working with us to, to kind of expedite this and, and get this cleared up. No, that's good to hear. And, yeah. and we were we were talking just before this as well about the, uh, you know, what we're we're seeing in Canada. Whether it's you're starting to sell your product today or you're selling your product two weeks from now. At the end of the day, everybody is fully tapped for supply. It, it's 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 pretty safe to say most P, most LPs are going to sell out regardless. So it's just a, a different time of when you when you sell out. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we are, we're at full production. We're at overproduction right now. Like yeah. we have it, we're kind of boiling over with, with plants everywhere. So, um, so harvesting almost daily. So yeah. we're still waiting for flowering room two to be uh, approved. And then, okay. you know, we'll go that, you know, hundred percent, you know, and, and start uh, harvesting and, and producing in there as well. 
Beautiful. And that was actually, again, we're, we're going right, this is perfect segues into my question. <laughs> uh, the current capacity that you're at, um, I believe, is 217,000 square feet. Correct me if I've... Yeah, so we started with 120. Flowering Room 2 brings us up to 220,000 square feet. 220,000, yeah. yeah. And, and are we, do you know if there's a certain timeline or a certain schedule that we're going on for that? So, like I said, it's been ready since July, so we're just waiting. Like, the regulators, they're, they're busy as well, right? So yeah. they've been very good about uh, communicating. So we're really hoping that it's, it's coming up shortly, mm -hmm. so that it'd be nice if everything kind of came in all at the same time and we could just get going. Exactly. Um, yeah. um, but, like I said, it's ready to go. And then, of course, is our uh, new construction. Right? So, yes, and that's quite large. For those who uh, may not have watched our first uh, interview together, that's another 800 and something. 780,000 780, square feet 000. to bring us up to yeah. that. Wanted to hit that 1 million square feet mark. Yeah, so, that's yeah, that has been underway since uh, July, August. Okay. So, we had some municipal drains to move. You know, there's always, you know, so many things going on in the background. So, um, everything. Uh, Everything's all being delivered. We've got um, building construction going on almost every day. Yeah. So, you know, we've got big equipment there. So it's very exciting. It's very uh, interesting to watch. So now, of course, you know, winter's coming. So now it's really a push to make sure we get as far as we can. But we're looking at still being done about Q2 and having the first harvest, hopefully Q3. Uh, of of nice. next year. Yeah, next year. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, John, going right into actual products, as we, we've seen... Uh, different provinces have uh, different varieties of products, and and everyone's talking about these derivatives, and everyone's talking these different ele uh, these different elements of, of cannabis, and a lot of them aren't legal right now. But what I just uh, recently found out was that after October seventeenth, uh, when it comes to research and development for these products, you've got full ability to research all of the. I know we've spoken about um, different ointments or creams and and actually one thing one of our investors pointed out was was sexual lube that that's actually a, a big product that's that's coming out can you speak a little bit do you have any uh updates on that or what's yeah. going on there yeah so yeah it was really interesting because in the acmpr basically we're allowed tinctures right but yeah. now with the cannabis regulations were just released uh, it's very interesting, all these different products that are now mentioned in there. So that really opens it up for us that Health Canada is open to these possibilities. So, yeah, we've been actually talking to different groups in the basically in the gray market here in Canada and Colorado and California, looking at all the different female oriented uh, brands and products. And, yeah, there's a really exciting one that we're hoping to uh, partner with shortly. So they are. Um, They've been working on um, kind of sensual products for, yeah. and then they have the proper, that's kind of the key is that, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the gray market that don't have the Health Canada or the, uh, you know, natural product uh, testing and research that's all yeah. required. So we're excited to really work with these really professional groups that, that have this all done already. And, and uh, but there's so many different products, right? So not yeah. just the sensual, the cosmetics, the, you know, there's female sanitation products out there that are, you know, for people, women are very interested in the natural products and the wellness products. And, you know, to be able to use cannabis um, in, instead of some of these, you know, a more natural product is very exciting to women. So I think yeah. this is, uh, you know, something that we're really just trying to educate women about, getting them comfortable about, you know, cannabis is, you know, such a, a positive product in, in, in so many of these brands. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 specifically uh, on why I think, like personally, I'm looking into these types of products as uh, as an investor, looking to companies that are going to be providing them, is because when you look at, uh, which I'm sure you already know, with the CBD and all these different cannabinoids, they're they're high in fatty acids, and they're high in, in all these different elements that usually for creams they're putting uh, fish oil uh, to get that. Yeah. So when you take that out, again, it's going back to all natural. It's going to vegan. Because some yeah. people do not want any animal byproduct. That's actually a massive movement yeah. across all cosmetics. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be very, very interesting. And that sounds like that's where you're going with, the, uh, yes. with part of your female brand. But when it comes to the cannabis side of things, how do you focus or, or cater to women? What, what are your main things when you're in the boardroom? Like, okay, we've got our, we've got our niche. We've got our demographic. How are we going to, uh, to go get them? So part of it is education. Part of it is changing the story for women. You know, there has been some... Yeah 
you know, we don't want women to feel embarrassed about using cannabis. We want to, you know, to kind of change that mindset. So that's kind of where we've, we've started and what we've been working on. Um, but it's really about, you know, there's just so many exciting products. There's so much work going on and we're seeing a lot of it coming out, out of the states, right? Especially California and, and Colorado. So those are the groups that we're really focusing on and, and seeing where they've had success. And, um, but yeah, like it's, it's a hundred miles an hour. There's just so many options out there. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and just to just to clarify, I mean, myself being a male, I can still buy cannabis. Oh, no, of I'm still I'm still open to have that. <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's 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 an interesting way of approaching it because there are, like you said, there's a lot of different products out there. And and uh, when it comes to women and men, yes, we have lots of our similarities, but there's a lot of differences still in, in what we're looking for in a brand. So interesting, or interested to see how that uh, rolls out. Yeah, and and you really hit it. It's really about how we're what we're looking for and how we see things right and that's you know being a, a female leader and and most there's a lot of my my department heads are mostly female i think yeah. we have an authentic um uh, viewpoint about where women what women want and where they want to go with yeah. this, these products absolutely yeah. and when it comes to uh being global and, and looking abroad are you are there certain areas where you know, UK obviously is going medical, Germany, mm -hmm. we've been speaking about Germany for the longest time. Yeah. Are any of these areas that you're currently eyeing, or do you, do you see global expansion as uh, a part of your business plan moving forward? Yeah, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, as much as uh, we can be hard on Health Canada, the one thing that they did very well for us is they, you know, it's, they're very strict on the product. And mm -hmm. globally, we'll see, we're seeing respect for that, that, you know, that, uh, you know the requirements that they have on LPs as far as GPP and our in our sanitation and and uh, our SOPs um, are, and testing right that yeah. uh, globally people are looking at companies are looking at Canadian producers because they know that we are under a tight regime and that our product is respected so yeah we we've spent a lot of time in in germany so i just came back from germany and there's so many there's so much demand coming from there so i can see yeah. some some great strong partnerships coming out of there so i'm hoping that uh will kind of come out soon and then yeah that was very exciting with uk and and their uh announcements as well so i think that yeah. there's, so there's so many directions and Almost on a daily basis, I've been getting an email, you know, it's like, well, you know, are, are we interested in, in joint ventures in this country? So it's very exciting times. Yeah. And, and yeah, and they keep having, it's coming medical first for the most part, but they don't really have many growers. I mean, any of our, our, our viewers will know that I bring this point up a lot where Canada is going to be the supplier of both product and, and know-how for, for some time to come. Yeah. But our neighbors to the south, they continue to keep shifting as well. We recently had the midterm elections where I think uh, Missouri, Utah, and another state just went with either medical or recreational. And there's just a lot of developments going on there. Uh, do you have your eye on any of the states right now? Or is that something where you're just waiting to see where the legal framework uh, rolls out with that type of aspect? Again, I think it's um, their requirements are totally different, right? So I think, you know, European um, requirements are very stringent and that's why they're so interested in us. So I think our partnership is really with the European. I'm not sure mm -hmm. about, it's It's so up in the air about what's going to happen in the States. So yeah, we're yeah. not focusing too much on there yet. Well, and, and also, I mean, you look at the political landscape is, is very, very uneven. I, I do believe it's going to, it's pushing towards legalization. You can't stop it now. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty, I agree, and a lot of, uh, all it takes is the CSE to crack down one second and what do you do at that point? That's why a lot of companies have been have been steering clear from that. Exactly. We don't know how many years it's going to be or if it's going to be months. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard to say. I can imagine. Now, uh, for investors who are watching this, and we've got a lot of different uh, catalysts coming up. Obviously, that sales license is, uh, is a huge thing, having that go as well. I just wanted to touch up, actually, it reminded me of a question about packaging. Uh, I remember reading a comment saying there was a packaging issue uh, over at Evenco, but it sounds like that might not be the case. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I was really confused by that too. I couldn't yeah. think of a pack packaging issue. Yeah. Um, you know, the only things, someone had mentioned that they had spoken to me in July, and I was trying to think, what issue did we have in July? Well, we were waiting for our excise uh, stamps at that time, but yeah. I mean, 
those are sitting in the vault right now. So, I mean, the moment that Health Canada give us, gives us the okay, we are, we are good to go. So our packaging's all been approved because, of course, you have to send those all to the provinces. They have a look at it. Health Canada's had a look at it. Yeah. Our, our label's all good. So I think as far as packaging, we're good. So yeah. all we need is that, that one little the okay. The amendment for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And then going into the question that I was, uh, I was getting ready for when I sparked another one in my mind, but uh, moving forward, what type of uh, different catalysts are, can investors be looking into? What are you excited for in the coming weeks and months? Exciting? Um, there's, there's so much going on in the background. So yeah. we've added PR firms and IR firms and marketing firms. So we're really trying to get our name out there. There's going to be, there's so many things going on in the background. I'm hoping yeah. <laughs> that there's going to be piles of news releases. It's almost like they feel like they're being yeah. built up on my desk. So lots of partnerships going on, um, you know, working really hard on our brand, um, you know, really getting ready for next year and everything that Health Canada is going to have. We have research coming on. We got our extraction license, so we're working on that yeah. too. So all these new products. So, yeah, there's so much in, in the background. I'm So we're hoping to release you know, keep releasing those uh, very, very shortly. Absolutely. Well, hey, I always appreciate your time coming on the show. Uh, thank you for updating both myself, but uh, any of our investors and viewers watching this on, on Evenco and what's going on. We look forward to having you back soon and uh, continuing to see the progress of your company as it goes on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. So we're being joined now by our missing colleague, Brandon, who is in Nevada. Oh, Hi, Brandon. Oh, God, Brandon's here. <laughs> Where's Brandon? How's it going? I don't know if you can see oh, me yet or not. He's oh, we can't to be here. see him, but I hear him. No, no, here we go. There oh, he is. There I am. <laughs> what are you How's wearing? <laughs> That's not we're a tie. Nevada. That's you got to be fashionable right? in Nevada. Oh, it's a tie. No, no, it's, a, it's definitely a land there. Ah, there we yeah. go. Okay, good. <laughs> So I don't know how the volume's here. We thought, you know what, let's just put us on to this live, but we're tethering from a cell phone. So if it gets a little bit choppy, uh, forgive me there. But uh, how's right, it going? So you guys far, are so doing good. great. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> are you still laughing? You're doing a lot better. <laughs> Carl's distracted by you your shirt, I think. He's on an interview right now wearing a sweater. So let's try to compare who's, who's in the... Uh, <laughs> oh, fair enough. You might have no, it there. Uh, well, it's cold out here, Brandon. <laughs> it's not. It's like 17 Celsius here. It's it's, uh, it's nicer, but it's not. It's not hot in a, any means. But is that uh, a tie? No, it's a lanyard. No, we went over that already. Yeah, we gotta so listen. you already missed the boat like, on I, that yeah, one. <laughs> I, listen, uh, people uh, in our audience are gonna love this. I was having some audio issues, <laughs> uh, so I couldn't hear you when you guys were talking about that ornament on your. Sure. Oh, well, but there you anyway. go. Excuses, yeah. excuses. Dude. It's, it's, all fa it's all fancy, bud. Oh, that's pretty cool. He's official. Well, so we I haven't hate even to admit it, yet, but... We've been waiting. Uh, what's that? So we haven't even gone in yet, because we've been waiting for this. Uh, we're outside of the conference, ready to go in, because it's massive. There are so many people here. And it's funny, you'll see them from in suits, they're in sweaters, they're in whatever it be. They're all here to talk cannabis, and there is, uh, there's a lot of different companies here. Wow. Well, that's cool that they're there to talk, but unfortunately, the numbers don't lie. Everything's a bloodbath right now. I just tuned in, actually. It is absolutely awful. Uh, Canopy's down like 14% the last time I, I saw. I think they, they came out their, their earnings today, I think, $30 million, uh, Todd was telling me earlier. For a company with a 15 billion market cap, you can imagine that anybody who really likes fundamentals and goes by balance sheets looks at that and says, why was I holding that? And that's not a negative thing against Canopy. I love Canopy. They're going to be amazing. It's just that much revenue compared to that much market cap. I think that's what we're seeing. And then everyone else is just follow the leader. So you're telling me everybody's forgotten that Canopy is going to take over the world with cannabis? <laughs> I don't think they've forgotten. I just think they want to pull their money. Uh, Canopy is going to be massive, and Canopy is going to be one of the leaders in the world for a long time. I strongly believe that. But just look at it. If, you, if you're a financial person and you're strictly on financials and you see them come out with $30 million in revenue, which is still pretty good, but they're a $15 billion company. You just, you know, you just got to ask yourself, is that share price a little bit ahead of the game? It's arguable one way or the other. But nonetheless, if you're holding Canopy, I mean, I think it's a – pretty safe hole that's going to be a, a Bruce is going to take that company so much farther still well 
just a plug, I'm pretty sure there's an interview today on Minus with uh, Bruce Linton. So everyone okay. should tune into that. Okay. Um, who are you looking forward to seeing at the conference? There's a lot of them out here, actually. I mean, we've been talking about uh, green growth brands a lot uh, over the last few weeks just because that's I like their style of what they're doing. They're a retail play. They're not necessarily growers. They're not necessarily medical. They're, they're coming out there saying, we're going to have retail stores everywhere and just going to beat you. <laughs> so wow. it's uh, I can't wait to see more from them. Uh, then bought some of them today. Well, what's the other one? Uh, Todd, what's the one? We're seeing uh, Lucy. Lacey. Lacey. Lacey is a really, I can't wait to talk to them because they're saying that they found a way to decarb cannabis uh, into just like liquid form, a consumable form, and, and keep all the components the same. For people that don't know the significance of that, usually like certain cannabinoids, I think it's CBG or CBL, there's a certain one where a lot of people really like that cannabinoid. It only gets decarbed and released properly when you smoke it. So if you consume cannabis, you don't really consume that cannabinoid the same. This person's stating that they've put it into uh, either a liquid or a form that you can have in a pill, whatever it be, and have all the compounds the exact same. I don't fully understand it yet because I haven't talked to him. So I'm really excited to see uh, who to go into that for that one. Do you know um, for those uh, cannabinoids, like we know we're familiar with obviously THC and CBD, what uh, do you are you familiar with what those specific cannabinoids what the effect is or if there is an effect are they used for i know cbd is generally like a health and wellness uh relaxation type cannabinoid it slows you down but i don't know anything about these ones yeah and i'm not going to pretend to be an expert in them either uh, the amount of times i've heard it and then forgot it because there's over 111 <laughs> known cannabinoids in cannabis and yeah, all we talk about like, is thc and cbd yeah there's like two <laughs> i'm pretty sure cbl yeah i'm pretty sure cbl is, is used to help you uh, with, with sleep and there's other things that go for inflammation but that's what we've been doing over this last year or so uh, probably two years where a lot of money has gone into research and development like uh tbp tetra biopharma like veritas vrt uh, these types of companies, even uh, GW Pharma and their CBD um, uh, patent they got as well, we're putting so much money into this research to find those things out because there's a lot of hearsay out there and there's not enough definitive data that you can take out there and say, you know, this is what this is for, this is what this is for, etc. I mean, look at Canopy Health, uh, a d division of Canopy um, Corporation that not many people are talking about. They have over 30 patents pending for specific cannabinoids and different things for pain management, for sleep, for things that he's not even telling us yet, he being Bruce. So there's a lot going out there right now, but it hasn't been solidified. So that's one of the things that keeps me very bullish about this market is that there's still so many different pharmaceutical concepts and products that will come from cannabis that haven't really even hit the market yet, that one of those can be a billion dollar product. Well, yeah, especially like even when you were talking to um, Melinda there in that interview, just hearing about even the, uh, you know, the cosmetic products that people are coming out with. Like I know almost every day since legalization, I've heard about some new cream or, you know, cannabis infused makeup, um, you know, shampoos, conditioners, uh, face washes, the whole thing. So it really is becoming this crazy massive industry, like, like really quickly yeah. too. Yeah, it's going to explode. It really, really is. I think, uh, again, another thing people aren't really talking about is the, the beauty side to these things. Uh, as I was talking to Melinda on, on the interview everyone just watched, when you're able to take uh, cannabinoids uh, that are high in fatty acids, omega-3s, omega-6, you know, those types of things that usually you'd use fish oil for a lot of these products, you can now use a plant where, you know, you've got that kind of a fad, if you want to call it, saying, oh yeah, there's cannabis and there's hemp in my products. You know, that, that, that's one part of the marketing scheme. Yeah. But the other side, the bigger side, is that you can make it animal free. And yeah, that's absolutely. very, very important to a lot of people. Uh, and, and that, I think, is going to be another multi-billion dollar uh, industry in itself. And we've barely even started with it. Yeah, and it's, it's the, like you mentioned with the animal testing, for example, it's a, it's a huge ethical thing too, um, because I feel like, in inherently just the industry itself and how it's you know how it kind of started in the culture that already surrounds it um, it's a very 
it's a very ethical type of product. Like people associate cannabis with natural, with the herb, with um, you know botanicals, stuff like that. So I feel like uh, moving forward, I feel like that. Well, I mean, maybe this is something you can kind of figure out as you're there. Um, is that a standard that's still going to be held as people pursue different um, products as well, it, especially in the beauty world? Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, there's already companies out there. I believe um, INSEE is the ticker for one of them. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. But most positive, they're working on synthetic uh, cannabinoids and things like that. You know, it's, it's interesting because you can take cannabinoids out of wheat and stuff. So there's a lot of other areas you can get cannabinoids. It's not just cannabis. But yeah, what I fear is that people, uh, especially in the States here, uh, if they're going to be pushing these synthetic products instead of the actual plant and pushing them to the FDA, I'd be really concerned if that started happening because now you're taking a natural plant, you're making a synthetic, which goes right back to all the drugs we're already trying to get away from and trying yeah, and to push GMOs that through the system. That. that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, watch out like for Monsanto it. taking cannabis seeds. I, well, yeah, and that's like a big fear. Like as, you know, I can only speak from my own personal experience, but as someone who... You know, I generally try to, you know, follow the organic, non-GMO kind of bandwagon. And, um, you know, and I'm also a cannabis enthusiast myself. So the, the idea that, like you said, some, something, a big company like that could swoop in and start sort of genetically modifying and refining uh, all, already such a wonderful natural resource is, you know, it's scary as well. If you were to take cannabis oil, would you want that oil extracted, or would you accept to ingest that oil, uh, or inhale it, whatever, um, if it was extracted with a microwave and radiation? Oh, absolutely not. I, I feel like that's something just uh, that we're all trying to get away from. And, you know, even just the pharmaceuticals, the things we take all the time, it's it can do a number on your body. And I feel like if you're going to, you know, manufacture it in that kind of way, it's... I feel like it takes um, the, the beneficial aspects out of it. It becomes more harmful than good, in in my opinion. What do you think there, uh, Brandon? Well, if you look into a lot of cannabis that's out there right now, uh, radiating cannabis is actually somewhat normal uh, in, in that process. And again, I'm not an expert when it comes to growing cannabis and all of that. That's one of the reasons I love coming to these conventions where I can speak to experts. But uh, no, we, we need to try to get to, that's why I love what um, Danny Brody and their team over there are doing at Tea God, where it's going to be all Tilo uh, organic soil. It's all uh, living soil. And, and yeah. you know, Calvin, we've had him on come on here as well. Uh, Calvin and, and his whole passion with uh, his soil business, where it's, again, Tilo organic soil. There's so much nutrients that we're missing from our veg from our vegetation, from our from all the different vegetables, everything that we're doing right now, because we're so used to pumping all these nutrients into our soil and having them depleted, between, whether it's corn or wheat, they deplete nitrogen and different elements uh, out of the soil differently. But when you have something like Tilo Organic Soil, where it's a living organism, it's actually doing what God planned it for it to do. That is so much healthier. You get so much better produce out of it. it tastes better, it looks better. You know, I would love us to go more down that route I also understand, though, that that is very costly and difficult. So it's it, it's hard. But uh, when it comes to cannabis, uh, I think you nailed it. You, you know, it's always been like this health aspect towards it. It's it's healthy. It's you know, it's it's different. It, it's not these drugs. Well, then why are we trying to make it those drugs? So right, right in, in a synthetic Let me ask you way. The same question I asked Eden: Would you inhale or digest cannabis oil if it was? extracted using a microwave and radiation? When I was a teenager, I used to smoke cannabis all the time. And I remember sometimes it was lighting blue. So I'm pretty sure that before yeah. LPs came through <laughs> and made sure everything was proper, I was already doing that and more. So uh, I'm sure if I'm still standing, uh, it worked. But uh, all the more reason to go with your LPs where they actually have really stringent testing to make sure they're not putting shit into your cannabis. Yeah. Well, and something like you could argue, too, is like I remember growing up and, you know, your, your teachers, your parents, all these kind of people are always saying like, oh, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. Um, which, I mean, granted, still, don't, don't, <laughs> I'm not saying do them. But um, 
you know, they, they tell you, oh, you never know what's in it. You never know what it's been mixed with. You never know who's made it. Um, and that was something, even as a teenager, like as, you know, I know teenagers are experimental with everything, but it does kind of scare you. And I feel like when we talk about this, as far as, you know, tampering with cannabis in that way, um, it kind of brings that feeling back because then you know you're not just getting, you're just getting cannabis anymore. You're not just getting this, this herb that could be quite healthy or quite, you know, harmless to you. You don't know what you're getting and it brings that, you know, that, that guessing, that guesswork back into it again. And I, I personally, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Yeah, and I've actually, um, at a luncheon I was at, and, uh, Bruce was speaking there, Bruce Linton, and I remember talking to him uh, really quickly afterwards, and they were talking about LPs and these different elements. And they were talking about uh, that they were going to have a campaign specifically talking about all this shit that goes into the black market cannabis compared to an LP. So don't get me wrong, LPs have a long way to go still. Uh, a lot of them, you know, they're learning that you can't just jump from growing five plants to you know, 10,000 or whatever, it's, it's a hard process and they're learning, they're growing, but you have to understand they're doing it in a process that I strongly believe is so much more stringent and so much healthier and they're making sure contaminants don't get in your product way more than the vast majority of the grayer black market. Uh, and that will start showing very soon. You're gonna start seeing that their quality will be higher. Right now, it's up in the air, uh, in the future, uh, I think that's going to be a huge selling point of why you go to your LP and not your uh, your backyard dealer. Absolutely. Well, Brandon, Canopy's now at forty two ninety one. Just letting you know. All right. That's still <laughs> still higher than uh, when I sold it at fourteen fifty or fourteen sixty or something like that. <laughs> Two we years ago. We also have a uh, death cross that formed on the small cap Russell index. So that's. Uh, did it cross? Good. Did it cross yet? Did it cross? I believe it did. <clears throat> I confirmed with a trader in our one of our chat rooms. Yeah. Mr. Where are they at? Yo. Yeah. <laughs> where are they at? Yo. Uh, it's the same I know, dude I know, all very, morning. Very so, guy. No. <laughs> so this is yeah. just a pattern for you today. I'm just looking well, at it. No, that's his, hand, that's, his hand, that's his handle, though. His handle oh, in our dude? Discord chat is where are they at? Yo. No, no, where are they at? Yo is his channel. Is his... Yeah. So <laughs> that, wasn't, that was a nickname. Room. I tell you, yes. learn something new about you every day. <laughs> well, thank you so well, much, guys, Brandon, I for might, joining us. We, yeah. I was going to say, I, I think you're getting kicked out from being able to do this, uh, not out of the whole convention. No just worries. Like, I got to probably stop this. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Well, thank you so but much for, you. Uh, for checking in with us, Brandon. Thank you. Well, that's too bad. Absolutely Are you actually going to get kicked out of that room there? No, no, no. This is like a, a, a random common area. I'm just going to... Uh. Anyway, can, can, you guys, can you guys turn the camera around so we can see where you're at? Oh, yeah. There's trouble. Okay, why, do you, why don't you go talk to people live? Uh, no, they're very, very strict here. Um, that's why we're being told not to do this right now. But uh, we're lining this up. We had uh, Jason Spadafora say he's got... Uh, a place we might be able to do some interviews with, so stay tuned. Who knows? Okay, cool. Sounds freaky. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, we're we're going to throw it over to um, a pre-recorded interview that we did today with uh, Warwick Smith. He's the CEO of American Pacific Mining Corporation, so we're going to throw it over there now. Today by Warwick Smith. He's the CEO and President of American Pacific Mining Corps. How are you doing today, Warwick? I'm um, great. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. So the first question we want to ask you today is we want to find out a little bit more about your company for um, investors who maybe aren't quite familiar with American Pacific. So if you could give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, absolutely. American Pacific's a, a fairly new company. So I, I would imagine a lot of your investors may have heard of us, but a lot of them may not have. We just went public in March of this year, uh, literally right after PDAC. Uh, so the company is run by myself, uh, and my business partner, uh, Eric Saderholm. So I'm CEO and he's president. Uh, Eric and I worked together previously. Uh, always had a great relationship with Eric. He's a fantastic geologist, uh, has been involved in a bunch of discoveries. Uh, I actually got him to leave uh, Newmont. He was the, um, the uh, head of exploration in the Western US for Newmont. 
So he left a pretty high-powered job to uh, to come and uh, and run American Pacific with me. So I'm I'm thrilled to have him on board. Oh, that's uh, awesome. The company so you've got is a good listed team. on C. Yeah, thrilled with the team. Yeah, Eric's Eric's a a fantastic guy. Hopefully, he doesn't see this and sees me complimenting him. Otherwise, I'll never hear the end of it. But, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, He's going bright red. No, His ears are burning right now. Yeah, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. <laughs> yeah, and then the uh, the rest of the team is a uh, is filled out. Uh, but board of directors is uh, Ken Cunningham. So Ken ran Miranda Gold. Did a, a phenomenal job there. Uh, I met Ken when Miranda Gold was trading around twenty cents and. I know they raised tens of millions of dollars uh, above two bucks, so he did a really nice job with those guys. Uh, and then Elnesh Mohan and a uh, and Norman Wareham, who's our CFO as well. Uh, so we've got a really nice team and a uh, and a great asset, and, and and it's a company that we're incredibly excited about. Okay, that's amazing. So uh, my next question for you is: um, Novo Resources had um, a great deal of success last year, but we want to know how did you manage to purchase that project from them this year? Yeah, we were we were quite lucky, and again, you know, like it often does, it it comes back to the team. Um, Eric knew Quentin Henning. Uh, Quentin Henning is the uh, is the CEO and 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 the uh, the real face behind Novo. Um, so both Eric and Ken uh, knew Quentin quite well. I had a colleague get in touch with me and say, look, you know, Qu- um, Novo's had this had a big run. You know, it's gone from eighty cents to eight uh, dollars, and it, it's been based on the the back of this discovery in uh, Australia. What they also had was a uh, what we what was referred to at the time, what we believe is a uh, a very nice high grade discovery in Nevada, but it was something they weren't doing anything with at the time because they were focused down in Australia. So the comment to me was, "Hey, you should take a look at this. Uh, it could be the perfect fit for you and Eric." Uh, although you know, my think the the thinking was it was going to be quite expensive. Uh, luckily enough, we got in touch with Quentin, and a, uh, as I say, you know, Eric and him had a uh, had a good relationship from their days at Newmont, uh, and Ken knew him quite well, also. Uh, and we were able to purchase the project for three hundred seventy five thousand dollars Canadian over three years, uh, along with eight hundred thousand shares. So, they make for they make for a great shareholder. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, how helpful Quentin has been for us. Uh, always there to pick up the phone. Uh, always there to uh, give us some guidance as to what we're seeing in the rocks and, and what have you. Um, so we're very thankful for his support and and a uh, and his guidance as we've a, uh, as we've gotten in and drilled this project. That's amazing. So what enticed you guys to the project initially? Specifically, the high grades of the project. Look, it's in a fantastic location. Um, it's about a forty-five minute drive outside of Elko, Nevada. Um, so, you know, from, from Toronto, you'd probably fly into Salt Lake and then, and from Salt Lake, you'd fly to Elko and it's about a 45 minute drive from there. It's right off the highway. The logistics are fantastic. That's awesome. Uh, it's so a how far, how far away from you guys are, how far away are you guys from, um, like a city roads? Are you guys, um, pretty remote in your location? No, the, the, the location's great. It's literally right off the highway. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's that's a, awesome. um, yeah, I mean, you you drive for about forty five minutes along. You know, I say highway. It's it's a uh, it's a it's a it's two lanes either way. So it's it's a significant road that's right up to it. Uh, there's power right to it. It's a previous producer. It was in production uh, back in the uh, early nineties. Um, Chevron was a uh, funnily enough one of the one of the companies who had an open pit right there. And then previous to that, there was production just above it, uh, out of more of a Silver Ridge vein, um, Silver Ridge vein set. Um, up above the project, so there's been production right there. There's power yeah, right there. So the, to the path project. was already kind of, you know, on its way to the project. Yeah, no question. I mean, this was one of those projects that you know it's had a, a great deal of work done to it, including previous production, as I mentioned. Uh, but uh, Novo had drilled it, uh, and then when Quentin Henning was working for Newcrest, he actually drilled it with Newcrest as well. Um, and it, they've just hit spectacular grades on it. You know, they've hit up to 300 grams per ton gold over a meter wow. and a half. Uh, they've got a uh, they've got uh, four and a half meters of 120 grams per ton, uh, 75 grams per ton over four meters, et cetera, et cetera. Just just spectacular grades. Uh, and now it's a uh, it's a matter of going in for us and, and systematically exploring the rest of the project. We have a pretty good idea on one of the vein sets as to what we're into. Um, there are others that have great hits on them, but there's 12 veins on the project. So that's how we see this get big. That's that's where the excitement is for us. That's awesome. So uh, you mentioned Nevada, where this um, this project is taking place. Can you tell us a little bit about the Nevada takeovers for you guys? 
Yeah, it's, it's been an exciting time for a uh, for um, for takeovers in Nevada. Um, Rye Patch was taken over recently. Uh, Northern Empire is, is the most recent takeover, and then Hecla took over Klondex. That was a really interesting one for us, uh, simply because Klondex started with a uh, an asset called Fire Creek, uh, which again was a uh, a high grade underground epithermal system that uh, that we sort of look at. As a uh, as a similar a similar type deposit to ours, um, you know. So we, we've seen a lot of M and A activity over there. Um, you know, we've you know we view that obviously very positively. Look, anything that anything good that happens in the mining industry is, is good for all. Uh, and certainly, if it's happening in your jurisdiction, it's it's good to see. So certainly, the the mid tiers and the majors, <clears throat> excuse me, are are paying a lot of attention to Nevada. And a uh, and a uh, you know that uh, I think that bodes quite well for us. So it's like iron sharpens iron. Like you know when good things happen for one <laughs> company, it's it's happening for all of you guys. That's great. Yeah, so, no doubt. I mean, I think. Uh, so I, mean, I was no, just no going to say within the next few months, um, like does that change your uh, kind of exploration plans for the next twelve months? Let's say. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, I, I think for us, the the intention is to get out. We want to go and do what what we refer to. It's what's called CSAMT, uh, which will help us show these other vein sets, which we're we're really interested to get out and explore. Uh, but then we're going to follow that up with twenty thousand feet of drilling. Um, wow. You know, it just puts more of a spotlight on Nevada. I think in terms of these takeovers. But for us in particular, you know, the key is going to be out and is to be out exploring. You know, as I said, we went public in March of this year. We were sitting here now in November. Uh, and we've already drilled 10,000 feet, uh, done a gravity survey, et cetera. So we're actively exploring. Uh, we're one of the companies that's out there, you know, really, really spending the, the time and the money in the ground. Uh, and we look to continue that as, as a, over the next 12 months. So with all this um, change going on, like you said, the, um, all the M&As that are kind of happening, especially in that area, um, f- for you guys, are you getting a lot of uh, newsletter coverage? Is there a lot of coverage about what exactly is going on? We've been quite lucky. Um, you know, we've got relationships with with a lot of the the different newsletter writers. Um, John Holstein's covered the company has done a nice job for us. Um, Bob Moriarty. Um, when we went to raise the money to go public, we raised three million dollars to go public. Um, the likes of uh, Nick Hodge, uh, Anders Narell from Sweden, uh, and Andre Dorsik helped us helped us raise money. Andre out of a, uh, Germany uh, helped us raise that capital to go public. So that was great. Um, David Skreek and Mike Swanson. There's quite a few guys who cover it. I won't remember them all yeah. <laughs> well on camera. Well, it's impossible to remember um, them all, yeah. But you've got some good people. Yeah, that no, have, but it's been... Um, you've got some yeah. good people that are kind of, um, you know, on your side as far as getting this word out there. Yeah, no question. I think it's an important part of the business um, is, is to be out and, and be telling your story. Uh, and if you've got people who, you know, that third-party coverage uh, is is huge, especially for junior miners, I think. Yeah. So... Um, the question I wanted to ask you was um, about junior mining and how it's been a little bit tough this year. Um, and in that respect, what makes American Pacific stand out? Yeah, a, a little bit tough might be an understatement. It's been a uh, it's been a challenging time in, in in the junior mining space. Look, I think there are some some strong differentiating factors for for American Pacific and the rest of the market. We've got an incredibly good team in all in all lean again on on Eric Saderholm. Eric's been involved in numerous discoveries in Nevada and the rest of the world, uh, has held you know very high ranking positions in, in Newmont, uh, along with other junior mining companies. He's somebody that uh, is real, really an ace in the, ace in the hole for us, uh, and that's a differentiating factor. Uh, the fact that we're a new company, that we've got capital, uh, and most importantly, you know, we're at, we've got a project that's incredibly high grade, uh, and really lends itself to success. Uh, I think that's really what differentiates us from from numerous other companies out there. There's lots of excellent junior mining companies, and you know, I, I encourage people to look at them. And, and any success in, in in that realm is good for all of us, as I've mentioned before. But I really think American Pacific has got a, a hell of a shot at success. Yeah. So you've got a good, like a strong starting off point right off the hop as well. Yeah. No question. I mean, look. You know, I've, I've I've touched on Eric quite a bit, but there's there's no doubt guys like Ken Cunningham, who's seen a great deal of success in the junior mining space, um, are are there to to be leaned on as well uh, and have the ability to open doors for us, like they did with Novo, etc. 
Um, you know, in terms of my background, I've been I've been involved in junior mining since 1999. Uh, I've done some venture capital work outside of mining, but mining is really my home. Uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, involved in Fortuna Silver from when it was a shell uh, and saw some good success there. Uh, same with Northland Resources. We was lucky enough to, you know, be a, a small part of that, but saw that company grow from from 30 cents to you know, raising 186 million dollars over five dollars and sixty cents. So, you know, we've seen some good success, um, but uh, but certainly the team that's a uh, that's around, uh, they're an exceptionally good team. With what I look at is you know an exceptionally good asset uh, that can work in all kinds of markets. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know Carl has a few questions for you about um, some of the structure, so I'll hand it over to him now. Warwick, can you tell us a little bit about the capital structure of this company? Um, maybe starting with the, the ownership group, the insiders, are you locked up? How much of the company do you own? Yeah, absolutely. This company was an IPO. Uh, we didn't take over a shell. We did a direct listing on the CSE. Uh, we're also listed uh, in Germany. Uh, which is where we raised a, a good amount of our money uh, and also listed down in the U.S. as well under U.S. GDF is the symbol uh, down in the U.S. Start with that. Company's got 32 million shares out. Uh, I own about 3 million of them. Uh, same with Eric Saderholm owns uh, around 3 million of them. Uh, I know Ken Cunningham has a good day, uh, a good ownership stake uh, as well do the other two directors. Uh, some of my uh, business partners from the, the venture capital side are strong supporters and, and big shareholders of it as well. So, you know, we are we own a lot of the stock. Uh, this is our baby. Uh, this is the the real key focus uh, for all of us. Uh, so we're, we're in this to see it be a big success. All of our shares are a uh, are three-year escrow as well because it was an IPO. Perfect. Um, those are the things I'd like to see as an investor for myself. What was that IPO raise at, or what was your last raise at? Valuation wise. Last raise we did was it, yeah, last raise we did was at twenty five cents. So the stock has been, you know, it, the stock's definitely taken pressure like a lot of the junior miners have. Uh, but we raised three million dollars. Uh, we've drilled ten thousand feet, uh, completed a gravity survey, and we've got about a million dollars left in the till as well. So we're sitting in a good position. Uh, we have taken some interest from some of the um, Nevada producers, uh, so we're having some of those conversations as we speak, uh, and we'll see where that goes from here. So I can currently get a better deal than you have on your company. <laughs> yeah, like unfortunately, I mean, <laughs> that's probably true. <laughs> you also don't have to work on it 24-7, uh, so that helps, too. <laughs> yeah, you can do it from the comfort of your couch at home. <laughs> ah, I like it. Well, you know what? I think this was a great interview. Um, maybe we'll bring you on in a couple months and, and follow up. Uh, if there's any opportunities be... in, in regards to, to raising money, I'm sure uh, our investors mm -hmm. might be interested. So. We'll see if there's an opportunity there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Warwick. Yeah, thank you very much to both of you. Really appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of months and having this conversation. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Later, dude. <laughs> and welcome back, guys. So uh, that was Warwick Smith. I was pretty pretty impressed with that company, to be honest, for, I mean, how new it is. That I like insane. it. I like the valuation. I can buy it cheaper than what they bought it for, wow. or they're in it. So hey, there's hear a that, lot. guys? Yeah. And everybody's mocking me because I said, later, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you walked right into that one. So. I, I, what's wrong with it? You know? No, there's nothing wrong with it. You just missed the peace sign that was oh, you know, supposed to go I'll with it. I'll do that later, dude. Yeah. <laughs> later, dude. Peace out. <laughs> so, so, Eden, um, what have you learned today? Oh, Lord, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's been, I guess, sort of being thrown in the deep end of uh, the stock situation side of all these businesses, especially, you know, we were talking to Brandon on the cannabis front, um, how many factors influence what, you know, not just our audience, but investors all over the world are going to be looking at as far as what companies they want to they wanna invest in. Mm -hmm. um, and someone who's, like myself, who's coming in not knowing much right off the top, uh, to see how many different factors are involved uh, is fascinating, to be quite honest. Yeah. Yeah, and you're just scratching the surface. Yeah, definitely. So now, if you were to get into a couple different sectors, like, so you, we've touched on mining today, yep. cannabis, and there's lots of others, what really piques your interest? 
Like, uh, yeah, well, I'll let you answer. Uh, well, the, um, yeah, well, what piques my interest, like, uh, like I said earlier, cannabis has always been kind of the main, the only real stock that I've ever had any sort of interaction with, uh, just via family. my family. Right. Yeah. And do you find that, you know, cannabis is very relatable? Even, and I'm not even asking if you're, if you smoke cannabis or yeah. whatever, but I mean, you know, knowing your age, that's, you've yeah. grown, grown up around it, right? Yeah, I, I do find it very relatable. Um, again, I can only speak for myself because I've always, I kind of grew up with a family that was very, you know, alternative medicine, natural this, organic that, okay. non-GMO this. Right. Um, so I guess I kind of had a more natural um, disposal it was at my disposal more um, growing up, but especially, yeah, it was someone my age and kind of seeing where it's come from even back when I was in high school to where it is now. Um, it, I feel like it is really relatable because it's grown exponentially in such a short amount of time, and I feel like that just gives me a lot of confidence as an investor going forward because like we were talking about with Brandon, it can really only go up at this point, even despite this, yeah. where this, how the stocks are looking today. Yeah. Okay, so how do you feel about uh, our rules here in Ontario as far as, you know, people being able to smoke cannabis where they would smoke cigarettes? Are you for that? Or are you against that? What's your... Well, to be honest, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say I'm on the fence about it. That's such a boring answer. I'm kind but... of on the fence. Yeah, because, like, on, on the one hand, uh, like, I've never been a smoker. Um, cannabis, uh, occasionally, but like regular cigarettes I, that's never been part of my life but I've had family members and friends and that smell has always bothered me um, whereas cannabis I'm more used to it but I would still you know looking at it I, I would still be as bothered as I would be as if someone was allowed to smoke a cigarette or someone was smoking so, one right next to me yeah so it's just even just the smoke the yeah. fact that you're you're inhaling something that someone else is yeah, blowing exactly out. you're inhaling someone else's air which is you know <coughs> just in and of itself it's kind of a yeah uh, not a great thought well I have two kids and you know I haven't experienced it yet but I, it would be disappointing if I was taking them to like soccer or something like that and there's a bunch of kids just, someone's lighting up yeah you know yeah, but I mean, you know, cigarette smoke, it, it really, it's, what's cool about this whole process now that having cannabis legal is it makes you think. Absolutely. It, it makes you think about, well, if cigarettes are okay, well, wait a minute, maybe that shouldn't be okay. And yeah. I, I mean, I know I'm going to offend a lot of people by saying that, and I'm not suggesting, like, we take people's rights away from them and say, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to oh, smoke. Oh, no, absolutely not, but, but I did find that interesting, especially in those interviews that we did um, just with people right. on the street. on the yeah. street, yeah. yeah. It was, it was I found it kind of, you know, kind of interesting hearing about how it's incensed some people were at the fact that you could smoke a, a joint. Like in Ontario, I think it's just in Ontario, that yeah. law, um, that you could um, smoke cannabis as freely as you could cigarettes. And in my head, I'm going, well, it's really no different. It's not like by virtue of them smoking next to you, you're smoking it but it's no more than someone smoking a cigarette, you're going to get secondhand smoke. Like, it's not, it's no worse, I guess. So it was just interesting to see the difference. They're fine with regular cigarettes, but the, you know, the divide that people are on, they're like, no, no cannabis. Right. So. Yeah, no, I definitely feel this has been long overdue. Um, how do you feel about alcohol and cannabis? How do you feel, like, do you drink? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, like, I, you know, do the occasional drink, um, but I have been hearing a lot lately. A, a friend of mine just had uh, THC infused wine. What? The other day. Yeah, I guess there's a wine. So they're getting high and drunk. Exactly. Which I mean, in my head, you know, sounds like a, a pretty bad idea. Um, but I guess I, it may not, I wouldn't know the name of this winery. It was just a, you know, in passing, he mentioned it. But yeah, cannabis infused wine. Um, Maybe if you're doing like the health side of it, like if it's, you know, the non-THC cannabinoids, um, so you're just doing it more for like, you know, as a nightcap, for example. If you put CBD in there, it's definitely going to be a nightcap kind of thing. Um, but as far as mixing the two, um, until, I, until I know more information, until I kind of am able to get more of like an idea of what it's about, how they do it, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it yet because I've, I, again, I haven't had much exposure to it, just hearsay, I guess. Well, I don't drink. It's very, very rare yeah. that I participate with alcohol. 
participate with alcohol. Yeah. yeah. I don't like the way it makes me feel. And uh, oh, yeah. know, quite honestly, I don't like the way it makes a lot of other people act. Definitely. However, you know, there's lots of people that have a few drinks and are just are fine. So. Oh, yeah. It all, it all depends. Well, and that's the thing with cannabis, too, is, you know, we're, we're talking about these two. Uh, essentially, it, it alters your state. Um, like, there's no two ways around it. Alcohol alter, alters your state. So does cannabis. Um, but it is kind of that idea that, um, you know, it, especially when it comes to alcohol, again, I, I have the odd occasional drink, but I feel like people are villainizing cannabis more than they are alcohol, even though I've seen drinks turn people into monsters. And so how much is, is it for a drink? If you're like, you know, you go out downtown Toronto, you're, you're going out like, you know. It costs my firstborn child, Carl. <laughs> That's what it costs. <laughs> so how much is like a vodka soda or whatever? Uh, I think the most expensive vodka soda I ever got, uh, I don't even know what club it was at actually, but um, it was just vodka soda and I think it was Grey Goose was the house vodka. And I think it came to almost $15. Um, and I remember asking the bartender, I was like, uh, d does it come with a unicorn? Is it served in Jesus' shoe? Like, is there a reason right. why it's this expensive? I can't imagine if it was cannabis infused. It'd it. probably be upwards of $30, $40. Who knows? <laughs> so. so it's really expensive to drink now, downtown. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, so it's, it's brought back the whole pre-party initiative that you <laughs> discovered back in school. Hey, let's have a pre-night party. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Let's just everyone <laughs> let's go over to like our house. Out. Yeah, let's just not go out. Let's just yeah. stay in. <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I don't go to clubs and stuff like yeah. that. I'm, I'm a loser, actually. It, I don't you know do what? a lot it's, of stuff. Oddly enough, a lot work. of people, well, and I mean, I, that's admirable. That's what I would like to be doing. I'm in bars more than I care to be, but that's more for, you know, if I need the odd job. Yeah. Um, but especially my age, um, it's like, and we were talking about this a bit earlier, we were touching on it, uh, just the kind of, the new sort of um, culture that has kind of arisen, not only just because of uh, technology and social media. And bad parenting? Bad parenting, I mean, I'm sure, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm not sorry. <laughs> you're not sorry? Entitlement? Right. Are we getting to entitlement? Oh, well, I guess, I mean, we could dive down that rabbit hole if we'd like, but I mean, the, the, whole, the whole social climate right now, um, I specifically find it, you know, just coming out of university just a little, little less than two years ago, uh, the whole social media, the, the way information is exchanged, even just conversational, um, in conversational ways, it really has impacted how people react to things. It's that whole idea that you can go on any form of social media platform, be it Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, mm -hmm. whatever, and you can give your opinion and you're, you, know, you think you're deserving of an audience. So that it's kind of, when you talk about these kind of hot button issues like cannabis, like um, well, you know, entitlement, like whatever, whatever the topic may be, everyone weighs in. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole um, stage now, it's a giant, it's the biggest public stage that's ever happened before, uh, I think, in our history. And the information I, age. The information age, exactly. And it makes you wonder, like, should people, like I remember reading an awesome article that, you know, uh, propose the question like should people be talking to each of each other this much because it seems to be causing quite as much harm as it is good in my opinion mm. yeah it's interesting though would you say you're an extrovert absolutely I would say I'm an extrovert who has introverted tendencies yeah. I like for example on a Friday or Saturday night more often than not you will find me at home uh, if I'm not doing any kind of work I'll be catching up on my favorite TV show, or I'll be uh, reading something, or I'll just, I'll just stay in. I'm just not, yeah. I'm not a big go out and dress up fan. Yeah. You know what? That's kind of me in a nutshell, too. I like enjoy spending time with my family, yeah. my better half, and the kids, and all that, and whatever. Um, I guess we should bring it back to speculating and investing. Yeah. Does, <laughs> just does, does, come right back, full well, circle. We're just killing time here. <laughs> yeah, whatever. If you got nothing better to do, hang out. Um, Mining. Did yeah. anything interest you? Like, for example, I'm, I, I have a mining speculative um, investment in a nickel discovery okay. in northern BC. And, you know, nickel is a key component to um, batteries for electric mm -hmm. vehicles. Absolutely, yeah. So that's kind of a feel-good investment, you know, knowing that you're supporting 
uh, potentially supporting that movement. Yeah, exactly. Um, that green, greener, greener uh, earth kind yeah. of initiative. And then you know you've got silver and gold and all that. Yeah. So does that stuff interest you? Uh, it does actually. Um, and again, like I said earlier, um, my kind of knowledge in mining is is limited at this sure. point. But you know, just hearing Warwick talk and kind of my my limited knowledge. It is something I'm interested in, especially when they were talking about, um, I was kind of researching for a couple different guests and, you know, graphite and um, how graphite is used in lithium ion batteries. Uh, and those are used in, I think Tesla is one of the biggest buyers for that, for the cars. Um, the, you know, it's used in cell phones, it's used in computers. So you've got, you know, we were talking about this age of information, this age of social media these kind of um, metals and minerals and you know all the stuff that comes naturally that comes from the earth is all being used to make these technological advancements so I think it it's definitely something I want to look into more because when you take apart you know like for, for example my my phone if you take apart my phone and think about all the different components that make this happen it takes you right back to these companies when you start at ground zero um, well, that's a really, you know what, you're absolutely right, yeah. 100%. Now, how cool would it be if you could take plastic out of the ocean, right? Yeah. And turn it into diesel that goes into a truck? That would be a company I would 100% invest in. Yeah? Absolutely. Well, yeah, because it, you're, you're, it's a double-edged sword. Like you're, um, well, maybe that's not the right, the right phrase. It's, um, sorry, it's a kind of a win-win because not only are you cleaning up um, our the precious ocean. resources, right. like the ocean, um, but then you're making the energy that, yeah, this, with the amount of people on this big ball of water that we're floating on, you need this kind of energy. That's, you know, that's how we've progressed as a, as a people. So I think you're kind of killing two birds with one stone there, but um, definitely that would be something I would invest in, yeah. knowing they're doing something. Oh, it'd be super cool. Yeah, giving back. And, and something like that. Well, because, there, yeah, there's a, there's a company I'm following that uh, is looking into doing that. Um, but I feel like that would get a, a pretty sharp following um, yeah. if they were to proceed with that type of thing. But we'll I'll save them for a later date. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about uh, technology? We don't talk about a lot of technology on yeah. the show, but... It's something that we're looking to get into. Um, do you follow it at all? If not, it's all good. But do you? Uh, well, um, what? Do you, which parts of it do you? Are what about you like to? artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence. Um, you know, it's it's kind of funny actually. <laughs> Shameless plug. Um, I'm involved with a, <coughs> a student production that's happening at um, the Ryerson College. They're doing uh, films. And I think there's three of them, uh, the one I'm working on included, that talks about um, artificial intelligence. And I think it raises, one of them in particular raises an interesting question, and it's that idea that they're trying to make, like, remake humanity. Um, you know, like I think one of them talks about, you know, the artificial intelligence becoming more human than the humans. Like we're becoming more of the robots. So it's like, this whole this whole idea of trying to I, I and again this is just my my opinion but when I think of artificial intelligence it is seeking human qualities out of a machine or out of technology and I don't know if I if I'm comfortable with it because I already find it freaky the fact that you know all my information is on this tiny little thing and so many people have an access unfettered access to um, multiple different people, millions of different people and companies all over the world. What do you think about robots taking our jobs? Humans, replacing yeah. humans. How do you feel about that? Um, well, again, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of a shame, really. Like, it's, it's fantastic the, the lengths we have come as far as uh, discovering, inventing, mining for more information as to how to create these uh, frankly, miraculous pieces of technology. But um, my question is then, to what end? Um, so are we going to replace all humankind with these things? To, is it going to make our lives easier, or well, is it going to po pose more problems? Yeah, I know. It's a fine line. Um, sometimes when I'm out, you know, I, I see 
how humans are treating other humans. Yeah. Um, I see it in, in the service industry, and I'm like, yep. fuck. Been the recipient of that. You're kind of <laughs> going to, you know, like, if you get replaced. Yeah. You know, we're humans. We're flawed, right? We, yeah. uh, we're sometimes not reliable. And if there's a robot. That is reliable. That is reliable. And you're yeah. a business owner. You know what I mean? I mean, people are not going to want to hear this, but the reality is if you're a business owner and you've got... You're looking for efficiency and that's right. you know, productivity. That's exactly. So then it comes down to, you know, margins and, you know, it's going to happen. It's like, for example, you probably are passionate about this, like GMOs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go back and think about how that started. Yeah. Right? So basically it was, it was a human, a farmer, who probably was introduced to this, right, yeah. from a company. And it was like, wait a second, I can grow stuff. And I'm not totally educated on this, so don't quote me on anything. But, yeah. you know, you can potentially grow faster and yeah. more, more of, more of that product and faster. Yeah. You can have the ways. supply to meet the demand. Right. And yeah. in, a, in a world where there's more demand for fast food and all that stuff, right? So, yeah. okay, let's get to the, the nuts of it here. So you basically have one farmer doing that. So now if you're a farmer down the road, how are you going to compete with that guy? Yeah. You're going to be like, you have this. Exactly. The, it's like, the, well, the scales are tipped so exactly. much in one man's favor. And when it was introduced, there probably wasn't a lot of data to say, hey, you know, like you're going to introduce this stuff into the human body. Your human body doesn't really know what it is, and it can be stored in cancer and all this stuff, right? Yeah, this is all stuff that's, you know, it's in hindsight. You're like, oh, maybe we should have, but. Exactly. Yeah. But the farmers have to com compete with, with the other guy. And, you know, now, so, I mean, that's how it starts. So I, I see that kind of happening. Yeah. When, when things are sort of introduced where it's like, well, not only do I, do I not have to deal with this unreliable human who sometimes comes to work, yeah. sometimes does, sometimes is more productive than not, it's yeah. going to happen. Exactly. Well, and, and then so, my question to you would be like, because something, like when I, when I think about it, you know, in, in my perfect idealistic world, if I could design everything, um, I do think there is a place for art artificial intelligence, um, and I don't say that often enough, but I do. I believe that, like you said, there's certain areas where we've almost kind of surpassed our own intelligence as far as the workload we're able to keep up with and how efficient and quick we can be as a human being. We've, we've almost kind of created better versions of our, of our own brains in a sense. Um, so I think in that respect, yeah, there, there are going to be jobs, especially as we go into the future, there are going to be jobs that maybe only a machine can do. Um, and it'll take, it might take some of the burden or it might take some stress off, off of the human race. And I really think that there is a place for it. And that being said, though, I do think that, um, you know, them taking over everything, like taking over certain jobs that could easily be done, like that are feeding people, that are giving them money, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a there's a place and a time for these things, but I don't know if it's a foul swoop kind of thing. I don't yeah. know if it's every situation. But. Well, it's 2.19. <laughs> kind of wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to wrap it up. Um, what else can we talk about when it comes to investing? Uh, speculating. When it comes to investing and speculating. What about real estate? You like real estate? Uh, to be honest, I like I said, I'm, I'm green. So as far as real estate's concerned, um, I know that it was really hard for me to get to a, get an apartment in Toronto. Yeah, we were talking about yeah. that. So now... That's my experience with real estate. Now, do you value home ownership? <laughs> um, I do, but maybe it's just because for so long I haven't been a homeowner. Like I've been a student moving to a new apartment every year, two years. I'll be honest with you. I think it's stupid. Think it's stupid? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe I'm just coming from a place of, like, naivete in the sense that I don't know what it takes to be a homeowner now. Well, if I was your age, I wouldn't value homeownership. Okay. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it, but, you know, that's just me knowing what I want. Yeah. Uh, but if somebody is, like, valuing, like, their time or mm -hmm. freedom, especially knowing in Toronto what prices are of condos even, you know what I mean? Like it's, you're basically going ridiculous. to work, get your credit, get your down payment, get your house, and now you're fucked. Yeah. Because now you need to go to work to pay for that 
that condo that's yeah, you're it's, already it's stressed almost not thin. worth it at that point. It's yeah, not I worth see it. What you mean. No, yeah. because I mean, really, your time. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't take on that liability, and you're, you know, you have a roommate or two, and you keep your your cost down, well, now you can go like, for example, you can pursue your, you know, acting and stuff like that, and go yeah. educate yourself, and go, you know, you get a random call like, you know, to go do a show or something. You're like, yeah, I can go do that. Like, yeah, that's your time. Kind of... You're passionate. You're going to be happier as a person. And I think a lot of millennials are actually. They're getting that. They're realizing now. that, yeah. Totally, I think they are, and that's a good thing. I'm well, happy. And it, and it doesn't surprise me. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I've never really owned a home, um, so I guess I, I, you know, I don't know what it entails. But I, it doesn't surprise me that that's more the mentality now, because you know, even just yeah, moving here to Toronto and the idea of trying to buy one of these places. Stupid. For and for what you're getting. Do you know what it caught like? It's unbelievable. For the condo, you live in a condo. I do, yeah. Okay, so for that cause, is it a two-bedroom? It's a one-bedroom. I live in the living room. Cool. That's uh, cool. Because you live with your sister, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's like whatever. We like drew straws, and she somehow got the bedroom. So, so I have like a wall. So now what that costs you, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a number out. You don't even have to okay. confirm it. Hit I'm going gonna, gonna to guess that you guys pay around twenty-two to $2,400 a month. Uh, just, just under in, in, 2100 2100 okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, 2100 right? Now, how much do you think that condo would cost you to buy? Oh, I, like, I'm, I know what our last one cost because it went up for sale. I think it was, like, 450000 or something like that, or maybe what, even more. What was that? And that was, that was another one bedroom. It was even worse than the place we're in right now. It how many tiny. square feet was it? I don't know off the top of my head, but it was, like, you had the, the kitchen, the kitchen, was um, uh, I think it was a, f a tiny like little it was almost like a mini fridge, an oven and a sink like on one wall in your living room. So you had one big random area that was empty, and then you had the bedroom, and that was essentially it. Mm. You got maybe a bedroom. <laughs> that was what you were paying for at at that point. Um, but no, it's it's crazy. I can't I can't imagine ever buying a condo here in Toronto. Yeah, things are different. Yeah, you know, like and I... And you know, like, I'm sorry to cut you off, but... No, no, go for it. But uh, I'm actually watching one of my stocks move up in price, and this is a good thing to see. Oh, cool. But, um, <clears throat> uh, no, like, people that sort of go out to the suburbs, right, to get a cheaper house... Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me either. No, because it's then like you're, you're just, commuting... You're like, making a, a compromise, a sacrifice that is needless at that point. Correct. So I live with my family out um, about an hour away from Toronto, if you factor in consistent traffic, right? Yeah. It takes me about an hour to an hour and a half to get back in and out. Yeah. I don't I only come down here once or twice a week right now, right? If I had to do that five days a week, I don't care. I would give up home home ownership. I would rent something down yeah. and I would have more time to spend with the kids and yeah. my family, right? And that would mean more to me. And then well, you yeah. take that capital if you have capital and you can invest it or do whatever. Exactly. It just it gives you I feel like it gives you more freedom and also you're not, it doesn't have you under the thumb of anything. Like you're not, ob well, you're obligated obviously to like pay rent and everything that goes with that, but you're not, you're not tying your life to this commitment. You know what I mean? And I know it's, maybe it's, it's the, the, the way the tides are turning, but I mean, you have to adapt. And if this is the market that is real estate right now and being a homeowner just isn't logical anymore. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just humans adapting to what their circumstances are. Yeah, I mean, you, you need a place, you know, you need a, a place to live. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, there's other things that are more important. And I hope, yeah. I hope a lot of uh, people your age are starting to value, you know, having their, their money work for them. Because yeah. that was something I didn't really pay attention to until I was really like 30 years old. And when you do that, if you, if you sort of educate yourself on investing and, doesn't have to just be the stock market. There's lots of different ways to make your capital work for yeah. you. Um, you know, I think that that'll bring you more time. It'll yeah. give you more of your time back. So that's a mes message that I preach uh, rather loudly in our community. Yeah. Follow the money. Well, it's 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 kind of um, it kind of coincides with that idea because I, I think something a lot of people make fun of the millennial generation right now because you know there's it's the age of YouTubers and. Instagram stars where you literally you don't do anything and you make millions of dollars 
And I mean, there is that, but also I think this generation is realizing that they don't want to work, you know, they don't want to spend their life at their job. Well, yeah. See, it's, but it's <laughs> like, I, it's, I know there's like yeah, yeah. two it's, sides to it. It's funny because I, I, I don't want to name him, but I have a relative who owns a... He'll know who he is. Yeah, it's know. okay. <laughs> if he's watching. He's got a pretty successful business. Yeah. But he can't take it to the next level because he can't find reliable humans. Yeah. People, whatever. Yeah. And well, it's, that's what they, they're, yeah, they're and he's like, humans. oh, you know, people don't want to work. And I'm thinking to myself, who the fuck wants to work? Like, yeah. so I hope it's not one it's of those like, things It's like, what's where, the least amount I can do for the maximum payout? Right. And listen, there's a lot of entitlement that goes into this conversation. So, yeah, like, I mean, I'm an extremely hard worker, but I don't really want to work for someone, and I don't really want to, you know, I, I'd yeah. rather Well, create. I feel like that's a different thing. Like, it's, it's, it's one thing if you want to, you're like, I don't want to work for somebody else. I want to... I want my I want to be my own boss. Yeah. I feel like that's that's a bit different, but there's some people like I remember I was talking to my like my friend's, you know, 6-year-old niece or something like that the other day and uh, she was talking about what she wanted to be when she grew up because I was telling her I was an actor. And she said I want to be a YouTuber. And I was like, "Oh." I was like, "Well, what are you going to do?" She's like, "Oh, I'm just going to make videos and I'm going to make lots of money." <laughs> and I just like I was done and I'm yeah, I mean different. I'm on the younger side of these like I'm in that millennial generation that's well, been doing this but I'm looking at her and I'm like you can do I, it you, like I know it's okay, I'll crazy. tell you a, a cool story so my cousin started a YouTube channel I think it was like 10 years ago he was 15 I think he was wow. 15 and he was just started like uh, doing videos like how to make a paper plane yeah like stuff like that this guy he's got like over 40,000 subscribers Right? Oh my gosh. He, the, the, they make that, it look that, so easy. That video, well, no, this is 10 years ago. Yeah. YouTube was different then. Yeah, um, it was a different he was, But he was making money. Yeah. He was, you can't make that kind of money on YouTube now. It's different. Yeah. But he was doing all these different cool videos, like just random stuff, whatever he was into. And, you know, his, his subscriber base kept growing. He was actually, he understood, like, how to market himself, um, not in the videos per se, but, like, behind the scenes, like, online, yeah. how to get your name out there. And then he started working... Uh, becoming like a personal trainer and he would do like working out videos and then he got into yeah. gaming and he would continue so on with that. So he kind of morphed he did. As, as he went. Yeah. Well, and but and he's that's, got a lot, he's got like, I think it's close to 50,000 subscribers. That's insane. But well, now. That's like, that's like, um, uh, who is it? Um, my, my sister is actually really into YouTubers. She knows everybody. And I think the highest gro gross, grossing YouTuber right now, is, he goes by the name PewDiePie. And he's the, he's kind of one of the original, you know, he plays YouTubers. games. Yeah, he's yeah. So people watch other people, people play watch games. him play games, and but I think I mean I couldn't again. This is all speculation. I don't know how much he actually makes, but he's I I mean he could stop right now and he would be set for the rest of his life. It's it's insane how much this has kind of grown. But like you said, the YouTube climate has changed so much. So although you can't make that it's much, different. it's it's different. Like even some of the channels that have come come and gone, um, you know these people have retired and they're like yeah. you know well and they caught on to something if you get onto it exactly enough, yeah they they kind of hit the sweet spot as far as um making yourself go viral i guess but well it's been a good show <laughs> yeah. it's been a it's been an interesting one that's for sure <laughs> thanks for coming on and hosting no today we had uh tw twinkle toes over there brandon in in, uh, <laughs> in uh, las vegas with yeah. his uh, ornament on his shirt he's gonna watch this later and just just no, saying. I love Brandon. <laughs> I, I, Brandon is like, he's amazing. And uh, I don't know. You well, know. that's well, I awesome, like ripping honestly. on people. I, my, my buddies, you know, we always rip on each other. So that's, a, you know, that's the only reason why. It's a sign why. of, it's a term of endearment. It's fine. It's Last like, week he was wearing a shirt that had birds all over it. It was like, it's just birds, seagulls. And then he told me it was seagulls. I'm like, oh, great. They just shit everywhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where your brain logically goes, That's right. right. I think of seagulls. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, no, honestly, well, I, I'll be careful what I wear if I ever come back on. But thank you so much for having me. This has been uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I've learned a lot. Hold actually. on a second <laughs> before we go. What was that accent that you were doing before? Oh God! Yeah, you're. No. I'm gonna put you on the spot. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, All right. so, so here. So read. You want me to read? Read this with your accent. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, for a little little pre little. You know, yeah, context for you here. Um, this this was uh, Brandon's email to me 
as far as coming in and kind of filling his chair today. Prepping, because he prepped. Yes, he was he was prepping me. He was giving me all the information. So um, if this seems out of context, that's why. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for stepping into the interviewer's chair for a while while I'm away on business. You've got some pretty cool companies coming your way, uh, two being cannabis and one being graphite. <laughs> there you go. That was good. Thank you. That was uh, a little bit of a kind of British Australian there for All you. All right. All well, right, mate. Well, let's, uh, let's hand it over to uh, the control room, put on our little outro. All right. Because we're out, yo. Wait, you have to go. Peace, bro. Dude. <laughs>